Hello, I'm Charna Davis Weesey. Welcome to UCF Profiles. You know, Central Florida is known for many things, theme parks, beaches, UCF, tons of sunshine, but thanks to the work of one woman, we also have a distinction quite removed from our tropical reputation. UCF is home to an expert of residents of quite chillier climes, polar bears. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Waterman and squirrels and all kinds of wonderful things. When I hear you talk about these animals, you know, with this, this show, my boss, as he said to you before the show started, it's all about the people here and the passion they have. And it's so obvious how much you love your work. Yeah, I guess I do. I um, always like to ask people, because, you know, a lot of students watch this, and some of them may be struggling, well, what am I going to do with my life, and haven't found their passion yet. What led you to, to do, what led you here to squirrels and polar bears? You know, the I'm, I'm not a animals. good example to other students, I think, in many ways, because I decided to be a zoologist when I was five. You did. And I'd already committed my life to studying animals when I was younger than that. I don't remember not wanting to study animals. And when I was about 10, I decided it should be something on, on behavior. Really? At that young, you yeah. knew that there was behavior in that? And I always wanted to go to Africa and do research. And <laughs> so when I, I was older, when I was heading into university, a lot of my high school friends kept saying, you should become a vet. You're never going to make any money. You're never going to get a job if you become an animal behaviorist. And uh, so I went and worked in a vet. And, and I admire vets, but it's not my cup of tea. It's not what I really wanted to do. And so I got an undergrad in zoology. Most of my friends, by the way, didn't get jobs in their fields, which were mar much more pragmatic. And I went on to get a master's and a PhD in zoology, and I am an animal behaviorist, and I'm employed as an animal behaviorist, which and, is kind of cool. And that's what you've, you, you don't even remember making that decision. That's no. really cool. I did my first research project on what it's like to be a zoologist when I was 10 in fifth grade. So it's, yeah. No, no desire to go into the antique business with your parents. We both have parents in antique business. I love business. antiques, <laughs> and it's a good hobby. Um, I was a graphic artist. I've done a lot of, of drawing and was encouraged to go into that for a career. And, and I think that would make it boring. It's more fun to do it as a hobby. Right. But my passion has always been to study wildlife and to study animal behavior. And, you know, as I've gone through the years, and, and I've been in the business now for a long time, of, of looking at animals and, and understanding their behavior, it just gets more and more exciting all the time. And, and so I've never regretted those decisions. Um, oh, there have been times when I, you know, get fed up, and everybody does, but I've never regretted it. It wouldn't be normal if you didn't. Yeah. You know, I always like to ask people about their aha moment, something I like to call an aha moment. I guess yours was in the vet office. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be a positive one, does yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's probably when, when the that, that people brought in the, the skunk, they hit on the road and wanted to know if they had, could have the anal glands pulled out to have it as a pet, and it was a full-grown skunk. I think, oh boy, that's just not my cup of tea. Um, and, and, you know, the Siamese cats and the poodles and everything, they're just, they're mean, some of them. <laughs> Big dogs, people tend to train. Little dogs, they don't, so they can be... Well, you know what? Difficult. This finger here... Uh, the tip of it was bitten off by a small dog. Yeah, yeah. Big dogs you can handle. <laughs> My Little big dogs, dog, he wouldn't even dare think of, yeah, think of touching me like that. I mean, there's a lot of interest with, with veterinary medicine, and it's ironic that now I've started working with a vet who's a researcher up at the University of Florida. And so I, I see what they're doing, and, and from the research side, there's some really cool stuff. But I'm an evolutionary biologist, and, and understanding, you know, I love mystery novels. I, I love mystery novels. <laughs> P.D. James, Agatha Christie, you know, all of them. And science is like that. Because you look out, and you know, in mystery, you say, who done it? And in science, you say, why is this happening? Why, why have they done it? <laughs> yeah, why is this happening? And then you try to figure out all the possible hypotheses, just like checking out all the alibis of all the potential killers. You know, you, you have all your possible hypotheses, all your possible predictions, and then you go out and try and figure it out. And that's awesome. And, and if you can actually get some answers, what you, when you know you've made real success if at the end of finding some answers, you have more questions than you started with. And that just makes it more fun. So you I'm just like keep ready going. to sign up for one of your classes. <laughs> I, want to I want you to be my teacher. But you, yeah. Yeah, I can feel their passion. What, okay, here's my chicken and the egg question. What Go came on. first, the squirrel or the polar bear for you? Um, the squirrels. I started working on ground squirrels in my, during my master's in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, and I studied a species called the Colombian ground squirrel. 
which is just this beautiful little squirrel. I mean, did you know that there are over 200 species of squirrels worldwide and that over 40 species of just ground-dwelling squirrels are in North America alone? And what's cool about them is you have individuals that are totally solitary, they live on their own, and then you have you have species that they're really, really social and they have these amazing complex social structures and, and communities. And that sort of continuum of different behaviors allows you to do comparisons. And so Colombian ground squirrels are sort of in the middle. They're not really, really social, but they're not solitary either. They, they have kin groups, so you have family groups that form. And I was actually looking at the development of behaviors in juveniles, in the baby ground squirrels, and looking at the development of social behaviors and looking at play behavior. And that's where I started. When I went to do my doctorate, I was really interested in the evolution of sociality. I mean, why are animals social? And as a tropical primate, you probably don't think that's an interesting question because you're used to being social. That's how you've grown up. You think everything should be social. But if you look at most mammals, they're not social. They're solitary. They hang out by themselves. They're, just, they're into survival. They're, well, of course they're into survival because if you don't have survival, you don't reproduce. Survival mm -hmm. is not as important as reproduction in evolution, in natural selection. Mm -hmm. And so looking at why animals are social is, a, is an interesting question. When you're social, that means you're hanging out with individuals of the same species that are your greatest competitors. They're going to compete for nest space. They're going to compete for food. They're going to compete for the babes. Why do that then? There are a lot of costs with hanging it out. You have to figure out what are the benefits. And there could be all sorts of benefits. And what's thought in North America is that sociality or being social has evolved in in species where they hibernate for long periods of time. So they can hibernate for nine or 10 months of the year. They're only active for three, four, you know, four months of really? the year. Really? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the Colombian ground squirrels, they come up in April and they go to bed by August. And so they sleep most of the year. They have a very short period of time to do everything. They have to get up, they have to have sex, they have to push out the babies, and then put on lots of fat so they can make it through the hibernation. And animals that tend to be, or species where they're larger bodied, they're bigger, it's harder. They, by, by halfway through the summer, the babies that are new have to put everything into getting fat and not into growing big. And so it may take them a couple years to reach adult body size. And it's thought that those animals, the, the, there was a selection for them to allow the babies to stay close to home, and then you start getting the evolution of a social system. And I wanted to test that by looking at a species that was fairly big that didn't hibernate, because you would predict then they should be solitary. And so I trundled off from my PhD to look at this species of squirrel in Africa that has just turned out to be a remarkable species. For one thing, it's one of the most social ground squirrels ever described. And I would argue it's probably, uh, other than primates, which are kinky and do all sorts of things, <laughs> probably one of the most social, uh, or, one, or up there with the most social mammals. So you, are you at the point where you can start to figure out why? Oh, why they are? oh I think one of the biggest reasons why they are so social is that everything eats them. They're a little mammal that lives in the Kalahari and in the Namib deserts of southern Africa and run around in the daytime trying to make a living, trying to find females, trying to eat whatever they're trying to do. And everything wants to eat them. The snakes eat them, the birds of prey eat them, the they're jackals like a snack. eat them. They oh there's some of them they're more than a snack. But that means that if they're in groups there are more eyes to watch out for potential predators. Right. And so I think that's been the major selective force that has led to them being social. But there are other advantages with their being social. You know, once you get groups forming, you get these other things going on. Um, their social group is unique. You've got independent female groups and male groups. So all male groups is unknown in any species of ground squirrel I can think of. And, and actually, social-wise, it's the closest mammal I can think of would be the lion. So they have a social group kind of like lions. You know how lions have all male right. groups that go around and mm -hmm. then the ma they, they actually will defend a territory. Mm -hmm. Cape ground squirrels don't do that because what's different about them is that these male groups, these all male groups that form are nice to each other and they're friendly and they're unlikely to be related and they're huge. They can get up to 19 individuals in a group. Uh, and most mam male mammals actually aren't nice to each other. They're usually trying to fight or set up territories or do something so that they can have access to females. And in this society, the males 
don't beat each other. They have a linear dominance, dominance hierarchy that is formed from displacements, one individual jumping back from another. Mm -hmm. And the key to being dominant isn't being big or macho, it's being old. So that the most dominant males are the eldest hmm. ones. They almost, they almost respect the, uh, the wiser ones. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But then uh, near, what you have is these males are not territorial. They wander over a large home range of about 12 hectares. And inside that home range, you've got a number of female groups that live there. And the female groups are related females, so they're very tight family groups. And they're offspring of either sex, males or females, that live with them. And so these males move around the, the felt and, and check out the females, see if anybody is actually receptive. These friendly male groups, is that what led to the polar bears? How yeah, the well, male polar if bears you think about friendly? it, I did my master's on play behavior. I did my PhD, and a big part of it was looking at these male groups and the function of male groups. What's the benefit that these guys get out of being in a group? Mm -hmm. And then for my postdoctoral and, and additional work after that here at UCF, I look at play in all male groups of polar bears. And so, yeah, they're, they're just a big fluffy ground squirrel. They're just <laughs> a lot bigger. I mean, they both live in arid zones and they're both ma mammals. It's not the species that's key, it's the questions I'm addressing. And so here I've got this background looking at play behavior, and here I, I've looked at the function of all male groups f in ground squirrels, which leads me to understand the, the questions that are interesting when you look at all male groups that are playing in polar bears. And someone might listen to this and may not be as interested in animals, God forbid, and think, well, what does this have to do with me? But how animals react and change and adapt to the world gives us a lot of clues about our life. Well, uh, we're just another Earth. animal. Right. And we're just another animal with another social s system. As I say, we are tropical primates, and that's why some individuals, like you know, your boss, have trouble when they go up to the Arctic regions and it's kind of cold. Are you listening? Yeah, <laughs> tropical primates, they are, they are, and you can certainly see that. And I always tease my students here that they couldn't handle it going up to the Arctic. Um, Do you remember the first time you went? Well, you're from Canada. So I'm from Canada, here. man, no problem. A. Yeah. <laughs> a. Okay. A. Um. So but I was looking up on the internet and some of the photos of the, uh, the tours that you have with the polar bears and how the polar bears come up and check everybody out and, le they, and lean on the vehicles. And People ask me, how near have you gotten to a polar bear? And I say, how thick is a pane of glass? Because, you know, sometimes I'm leaning on the window and I'm not looking and they come up and they're looking with their nose and they're right on the other side. And all the stories about attacks, that's just a lot of fluff. Oh, it, it that, there hasn't been a, a fatality in Churchill in 21 years. Churchill's the polar bear capital of the world. Churchill, Canada. Manitoba, Canada, and that's where we have gone to look at the bears for uh, the last um, 12 years. I've been going And one of and the forth. fatalities, they were teenagers bugging them, weren't they? Harassing Not them? in Churchill, no. But, it, I mean, just it, in the world, one of the, uh, they were, weren't the, I, 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 I read know. something on the internet that they were actually pelleting them and hitting it with BB guns. Not, not a bright thing to do with a thousand pound animal. No, <laughs> it isn't. It's a really stupid thing to do. And the, the fatality in Churchill, I can't remember if it was 83, I think it occurred. Um, it might have been 85. It, <laughs> a, a hotel had burnt down and the walk-in freezer was in the basement and a bear and the local um, dam for out or whatever decided to both raid the, the walk-in freezer at the same time uh -oh. and the polar bear won until he went to escape and then they shot him. So nobody won. They both ended up dead. Right. Yeah. Have you seen changes going back there? You know, the global oh. warming is such a huge issue these days. Have you seen changes in what's going on? Are there, are, are, are there hunting, are there less hunting times or are they being affected by it? Well, what time we're looking at them, they're on vacation. So you have to understand that what's important for bears occurs out in the sea ice. They are a marine mammal. Everything they do that's important, feeding and insects, is out on the sea ice. When we see them, it's because the sea ice is melted and they're forced onto land. Females move about 50 kilometers inland. If they have cubs with them, they just sit down under a tree. If they're pregnant, they'll go into a den and prepare to go through a, um, a type of hibernation where they'll actually give birth and spend three months lactating while they're asleep. I think as, as a mother, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> um, and the males... Twelve years might be nice to do that. <laughs> yes. They only do it for Relax. three months. But <laughs> as, uh, the males, uh, typical guys, you know, they take about three steps on shore and then 
plop themselves down and wait <laughs> for the sea ice to form. Basically, that's what they're doing. There's very little feeding at that time. They are opportunistic. If they, they'll you feed on blueberries or grab a goose here and there, or if something a carcass walks up, uh, washes up on shore, they'll they'll take it. But basically, they just lie around to sleep. Don't mind your home. Anyway. <laughs> In the autumn, what happens as, as it starts in the fall, it starts to freeze up. You start to get the colder weather. These males start to migrate up the coast and position themselves in the area where the first sea ice is going to form. And that is, is key that as soon, within 24 hours of real sea ice being there, they're gone. It doesn't matter how much human food you put there or whatever, the bears are gone. Mm -hmm. They're out on the sea ice, they're making a living again. So the time that I'm looking at them is a period of time when they're not feeding and when they're not actually having to compete over any resource. And that's when you get these males that are along the coast making any groups anywhere from two to 14 individuals in the group and they actually interact with one another very gently. So once again you have males that six months later could rip each other apart during the mating season in May but in October, November I've never seen any serious injury. And they're just bonding and playing and having a good old time. So are you seeing a different, is, there a, is, is it warmer? Are they, are they having as much time out on the sea ice? Uh, well, or? other researchers have looked and certainly found that the sea ice appears to be melting earlier, uh, a couple weeks earlier, and the bears are coming off in worse and worse body condition uh, from what they had in previous years. We actually have the data but have not yet tested whether behavior is changing with the, the temperature and with the sea ice melt. Looking and for other forms of food? at other times? Or? Well, what I think is that uh, play behavior is very costly. It, I mean, it can you, calories. Uh, yeah, you, these guys can play up to an hour. And I mean, they're really at it. They're wrestling, they're pushing each other, they're rearing up, they're doing all that stuff. That, you can see a cost of that right away. If, if, if when they finish, they often lie down exhausted and pant. Mm -hmm. So you can see the cost. Okay, right away, if I see a cost, as an evolutionary biologist, I say there has to be a benefit that outweighs this cost. Otherwise, they're just going to die. So there has to be some benefit to this behavior, and I'm trying to look at what is the benefit to the behavior. And we have a bunch of hypotheses that, that we're addressing. Now, if they are coming off in worse and worse body condition, then it may get to the point where they cannot afford energetically to participate in these behaviors. And so that's something that we can look at our data and we hope to continue over the next few years to look at to see if changes in climate are affecting their behavior. Now I'm wondering, just life-wise, having two kids, I know having little kids, fairly young like mine are, and you go to Africa and you go to Canada and everybody goes, everybody's packed up, everybody goes, how's, how's that, how do you work that? How do you work, how do you work your life? Well, it's um, <laughs> exhausting. <laughs> um, our, our boys go with us to Africa. And they're six and eight. They're six and eight and they have gone over since the youngest was 14 months old and the oldest was three. And so they don't really, I mean, Africa is just part of their life. And when we're there, we have substantial part of our time that we have no electricity. And if you want hot water, you go collect the wood and you make the, the hot water with a, what they call donkey in the back. It has pipes and you make a big fire underneath it and, mm -hmm. and it heats up some tanks. And I think it's good for the boys um, to live a life that is very basic. They have got friends that are German, that are Afrikaans, that are Swana, that are Nama. They've had to learn about a lot of different cultures. Do they speak different languages? Uh, badly, yeah. They find a way to communicate. Isn't it amazing how wherever you go with children, they immediately walk up to each other and make friends? Oh, they don't have a problem. <laughs> they just start playing, even if they can't communicate. And uh, so they, they're very comfortable going there. They're more comfortable than my, initially my grad students are when they first go over, because the boys know it. They know the food that they like there. When they're there, it's cook sisters and, and biltong and all this food that they like that they can't get over here. And what yeah. time of year? You go there in the summer, and then you have to be back for them for school? Right. It, it's our summer, but it's their winter, winter there. And so uh, it is cold. My eldest son, who's eight now, would like to go in the summer at some point, their summer, because he'd like to do some birding and see the birds in, in the summer coloration, because they're gorgeous. In the winter, they're a lot more drab. So they have not gone with you to Canada? Uh, my eldest son went last fall. Oh, he did? Fall. Uh -huh. He went up to Churchill. Uh, we gave him a choice of birthday party or going to Churchill, and he chose Churchill. That's right. We did talk about that. Yeah, and so he came up and was up there for about five days and went out in the field with us. Um, 
and was a good field assistant. We were working with Earthwatch, which is a, an organization that matches up volunteers with doing research, and so he was part of our Earthwatch group. Uh, uh, although you know he he, uh, it was a good experience for him. Yeah. Do you think he's um, made his decision about his career choice like you did at that age? No. So he's not as passionate about it as you were. Um, he likes ornithology, and he loves reading. He's a passionate reader, but n no, I don't think so. Now his dad, of course, m uh, my spouse, is a professor at UCF as well mm -hmm. in ecology, and he didn't make up his mind till quite late in, in his career. So. Maybe takes after him. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Indecisive or what? Now you're yeah. not going to Churchill this year. But the reason why is very exciting. We are working with a nonprofit organization, uh, Polar Bears International, and they are actually putting a robotic camera out 30 kilometers from where the tourist zone is so that we can look at the behavior of bears and control the camera from UCF, from Florida. I like the idea of sitting at my computer with my latte <laughs> and being able to do my behavioral observations and oh, not look having what to doing. How cute. cart all the gear <laughs> up there and everything. But also there's a, a huge component of this which is educational that we will be um, working with some zoos and high schools around the world to bring this as part of their curriculum to do work and help us do research on the polar bears. Have you already had web, cl web classes? I've already beamed into my class from Churchill out in the tundra. There's a satellite link, and I have beamed into my animal behavior class here. And it's it's so much fun to do that because the students have been taking animal behavior with me for a couple months by then, and they understand the theory. And then I can talk to them about, okay, here I am. Here's the bear I'm looking at, and this is how I do my research. And they can ask me questions. It's a two-way video link. So they ask me questions. I know who they are. They can see me, and I can show them what I'm looking at out the window. And the time difference is not that much from Canada. It's an hour difference. Yeah. So, so you can actually, it's, it's not that much of a problem to do it while they're in class. Oh yeah, it's wonderful. Um, two years ago I beamed into the Orlando Science Center and and had a the similar sort of discussion with 200 middle school students um, that uh, for the women in science and engineering group that we have at the University of Central Florida. And to talk about what it's like to be a field biologist, what better way to do it than be in the field when you do it. And Was there any in. particular question you heard over and over again from these kids? or? Any observation that they had? A lot of them asked me about global warming. They seem to be very uh, acutely aware of the changes that are occurring worldwide with the temperature. And a number of them asked me about other things that could be impacting polar bear populations. So I was uh, very impressed with the questions that the, the middle school students asked me. In the animal behavior class, they understand a lot more about the theory behind it, and so they, they tend to ask me also more evolutionary questions about the bears. And, and speaking a bit evolutionary, the global warming topic is very hot from the from six year olds to sixty it six is. year olds, and and uh, watching it and studying it, and and the, there's always there seems to be the battle of this is cyclical versus this is man made. Um, any idea actually being in the thick of it out there? Well, I'm not a climate specialist, and so I uh, have to look at the evidence that's presented to me by climate specialists. But even when the uh, upper administration of this country r refused to deal with it and had experts that they assigned to look at it, those experts came back and said that there's a human impact on, on cl climate change. You would almost and think there would have to be with what we've done to this world. <laughs> it, it's just a no-brainer. I think that the people arguing are just arguing for other reasons, I don't know, but certainly climate change is occurring. Certainly, all the data support that it's there's a human basis to the how rapidly it's occurring. I think it's like extinction. If you look at extinction, extinction of of species is absolutely normal and has occurred since life began. Some species go extinct. It's the rate in which it is occurring that is so different. So you've got this dramatic increase of over 10,000 or approximately 10,000 species a year that are going extinct. And that rapid increase is because of the way humans are behaving. The same thing when you look at climate warming. It, climate warming, yeah, climates go all the time, but it's the rapidity, how quickly it's occurring, and the fact that we could have done something about it. Maybe we could take our clues from the squirrels, the ground squirrels, and work together to protect each other, you think? Are they a little bit more evolved than we are then? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you can really compare them. Uh, but certainly the ground squirrels, for uh, what they suspect is that Africa will become more arid, 
and the species I study is an arid adapted species, so they will do very well with the upcoming climate changes in Africa. When, and, and, and you are going to Africa this year, but not going to Canada. What's the, uh, we only have a few seconds left. What's your biggest dream? place to go, thing to research. If, 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 I, if I was the research fairy and I said, boom, you have it, what would it be? Uh, antelope ground squirrel out in Arizona and New Mexico. Man, they're awesome. That doesn't sound that's, that's so far out of your reach, I don't think. <laughs> well, I have, to, I have to get there. <laughs> Dr. Jane Waterman, thank you. This went by way too quickly. I have a thousand more questions and I, I want to go home and Google ground squirrel and polar oh, bears and find out more. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks for watching. I'm Charna Davis-Wiese. Join us again next time on UCF Profiles.